and I am contracted by the State Office of Rural Health to um, lead the Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Project. And um, the group today is the small group of hospitals and clinics that are working to address substance use disorder and human trafficking. So it is a smaller group. We welcome you to unmute your line and ask questions at any time. Uh, I also work very closely with Jessica Thomas and Elizabeth Burroughs with Burroughs Consulting. And they lead the efforts kind of from the clinic perspective. And then I lead the efforts from the critical access hospital perspective. But we definitely work together side by side to try to get you the resources you need, the best practices, and make some good connections so that you can care for our rural patients well and hopefully uh, identify anyone who may be being trafficked for various reasons. Um, so for today, we're going to have some focused education on human trafficking with a little special effort around body uh, brokering or patient brokering or human brokering, as you may uh, hear some different terms. But it's a you know an illegal practice that you, is used by some rehab facilities. We're very fortunate to have uh, Deanna Paddock. Uh, Deanna both works currently at the Department of Health, but she's working with us on uh, an effort through her consulting company uh, where she provides not only education around um, human trafficking, body brokering, and substance use disorder, but also provides infection prevention consultation, public health education, and several other health topics. Uh, she has some personal experience with this situation, so um, really drives home the need to address these issues, particularly here in Indiana, because some people believe these things don't go on in Indiana, and they do. She's also going to cover the Community Reinforcement and Family Training, or CRAFT, model to share with you so that um, you may be a model that you're interested in having additional detailed training on to help your patients with substance use disorder. So today's presentation really kind of has two components, a human trafficking component and the substance use disorder component, but definitely the two often go very much hand in hand. So I'm gonna turn it over to Deanna. Um, please open up chat. I will be monitoring chat, so you're welcome to put any questions in there. If you could also put your name and your hospital so that we can take a very accurate attendance, that's extremely helpful, particularly when there's more than one person in the room with you or your participant name isn't well identified when you log into Zoom. Uh, you can unmute your line by opening up that participant icon by hovering at the bottom of the screen, opening that up, and then clicking the red microphone button uh, beside your name, or there's also a mute button to the left-hand side of the screen at the bottom when you hover there that you can open up your line there as well. Um, well, also welcome you to turn on your video camera if you have one on your computer. That makes for good interaction and with it being the smaller group today, why um, definitely gives you that connection with other people and you can also see other people that are on from other hospitals. So Deanna, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Becky. Um, and thank you really to all of you for allowing me to be here and share my story on this platform. I know we've presented in the past and some of the feedback really um, was, you know, kind of what are my expertise and outside of being a registered nurse, having worked in the emergency department and in trauma care for well over 20 years and being an infection preventionist at the state health department. Um, what gives me the expertise in this is my true personal account and my true personal story with this situation. Um, I don't think that I even knew 
truthfully what human trafficking, patient brokering, body brokering, patient shuffling was until I was faced with it personally in my own life. And then I just dove in and learned and educated and researched myself um, on everything that I could possibly find. So thank you for being here. Um, thank you for allowing me to share with you, allowing me to be vulnerable with you um, and giving my personal story. And I do hope that at the end of this, there will be some takeaways for you, um, both in your practices and maybe just even personally while you're out in the community as well. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I like to start with really the breakdown in the basis, the etymology of human trafficking. What I hope that you're gonna to gain today is understanding what is it, where does it originate or did it originate? What are the realities here in Indiana and who are the key players? What do you need to know and how can you help? And I really do think it's important to understand human trafficking is a global crime that trades in people and exploits them for uh, profit. There's people of all genders, ages, and backgrounds who are the victims of these crimes. And it occurs in every region of the world. And yes, it occurs in Indiana. Traffickers often use violence fraudulent employment agencies, fake promises of education, of job opportunities, some trickery, coercion, all in order to deceive the victims that they're looking at. Um, it's organized networks with individuals um, behind this who are actually very lucrative in taking advantage of people who are vulnerable, desperate, or simply seeking a better life. So this is going to be key in understanding this piece of body brokering um, and patient brokering. These are people who are vulnerable, often substance use disorder. We're really focusing in on this particular piece of human trafficking. These individuals who are dealing with substance use disorder are desperate and at the end of the day often are just wanting a better life. Um, the human trafficking um, by the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, which is a mouthful, <laughs> um, means that the act of trafficking is the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons. And the means of trafficking includes threats, force, deception, coercion, abuse of power, position, or vulnerability. It's a, again, it's a global crime that trades people as commodities and exploits them for profit in some way. And then, Talking about where does it originate, um, really there's a great history of human trafficking that was done by the Exodus Road Project, which is a resource that um, you can look at and look up. And it kind of just gives an overall in general timeline of trafficking, right? At the end of the day, um, for most of human history, and across all continents, cultures, um, and areas in the global world, slavery was legal, it was regulated, and it was common. It was often perpetrated by one people group or another. Um, in the 19th and 20th centuries, however, an international movement began to abolish slavery in all forms, understanding of and fighting against human trafficking have since grown out of these mo movements. Um, slavery obviously is no longer legal anywhere in the world, um, but human trafficking still occurs in every country, on every continent, in every state, in every city. That is crucial to understand and know. 
Um, it is a modern day form of slavery. And a little bit more on the history, I will not speak too long on this. Um, the Exodus Road Project really did a phenomenal job on um, delving into the history. But when we're looking at the history of slavery, human trafficking, we go all the way back to between 1500 and 1866. So we're going all the way back since the dawn of time and we see the transatlantic slave trade. That was really where Portugal began traveling overseas to Africa, um, purchasing or capturing people, enslaving them and bringing them back to Europe. Um, and so that occurred for the next 350 years in our society and 12 and a half million slaves were actually shipped from Africa around the world. Interesting, um, when they looked at the history of this, out of those 12 and a half million, 10.7 million arrived in the United States. We accounted for 10.7 million. The numbers were just phenomenal and kind of blew my mind when I looked at it. So this continues, you know, the next 350 years. Then in 1807, Britain is the first country to actually outlaw slavery. And the United States follows in 1820, which was 40 years before the Civil War. Um, then you have 1850 to kind of 1900s, we see the trafficking of Chinese women into the United States. Um, often drawn here, again, by the promise of lucrative jobs, typically associated with the California Gold Rush and the construction of the Central Pacific Railroad. Um, these women often became targets of violence, um, racial hatred, um, and were just overall looked down upon and frowned upon by our society and our culture. Um, in 1875, you have the PAGE Act, and that's P-A-G-E, and it sought to limit the number of immigration of Asians into the U.S. Um, to prevent the trafficking of unwilling people. This effectively stopped the immigration of nearly all Chinese women into the U.S. Unfortunately, um, it didn't stop the population of um, male Chinese men here in the United States who spurred additional illegal trafficking of these women. Um, and these Chinese gangs were referred to as Tongs. And um, they enslaved their um, women and began selling them um, for commercial sex acts and individuals. Then we see um, 1900 to 1910, we have the International Agreement for the Suppression of White Slave Traffic. Um, that was the abolition of the African slave trade. Um, it was the first signed international agreement on human trafficking, which was that, that was called the Man Act. 1919, you have international labor organizations. Um, they're formed to protect working conditions. They're trying to decrease human trafficking during that time as well. So there's a lot of history behind this. Um, current date in 2000, the United Nations had a protocol to prevent and suppress and punish trafficking in people, especially women and children. Um, and again, this is a whole other truly like PowerPoint presentation. Um, but these are just some key dates, some key time periods in our own country to really understand where did human trafficking originate from. Um, so what are the realities in Indiana and the key players? Uh, the realities in Indiana are, and I'm in a lot of groups and various, um, you know, advocacy 
programs and realms. And oftentimes when we take information to senators, legislators, um, to talk about human trafficking, particularly in the group of substance use disorder, we are told most times than not that Indiana does not have a problem with human trafficking, that it, it doesn't occur here. I can guarantee you, I promise you, it occurs here. Indiana is trafficking individuals for many different reasons from here to other states. Um, and we'll kind of walk through how that happens. Key players of trafficking are often organized crime. Um, you're looking at, uh, you know, some drug, uh, organized crime drug ringleaders. Um, surprisingly, though, and I'll show you this by the end of the presentation. Um, addiction treatment centers, insurance companies, even some um, medical care providers are the biggest key players in human trafficking. We'll give you information on what you need to know, which is kind of what we're doing right now. And we'll also give you information on how you can help. So in understanding human trafficking, it's also important to understand that there's different modes of human trafficking. There's modes of trafficking for sexual, meaning someone's forced into a sexual activity for the financial gain to another person or a trafficker. Can be done in person, can be done online, can be done on social media, through platforms, um, but that if they are participating in a sexual activity, whether it's pictures, chat, um, or an act themselves for any kind of financial gain, um, that person is being trafficked. The other mode is for insurance. Um, and I think that this has always been the eye opener when I give this talk and presentation for people is getting them to understand and recognize how people are trafficked for their insurance and how that is occurring. So if you're being trafficked for your insurance, that's really the process of billing insurance companies excessively for unnecessary treatment or services. And we'll walk through how this is happening and what you can be aware of. Um, and that really truly is today's focus, human trafficking in the insurance industry. And then you have trafficking for labor reasons that working an individual under harsh working conditions with no compensation or um, living wages. And these are oftentimes what you think of as like migrant workers. Um, you see it a lot in construction, we see it a lot in farms um, in that the individual is being paid very little or you can see it in factories. They're being paid very little, not enough to even live on. Um, and they're kind of being brought here or given these um, jobs, so to speak, uh, with very little resources um, and the use of coercion and threats as well. So I'm gonna take a pause here and what I am about to show you kind of gives you a clue as to what we're talking about when we say patient brokering, body brokering, the patient shuffle. This is a clip um, of a movie that's out currently and it is based off of real true live events. And the title of the movie is Body Brokers. Um, to summarize the movie, you have an individual who's a recovering addict or who is in active use. And they're brought to Los Angeles from their Midwest town. That's a key here, from their Midwest town, brought all the way to LA to go to a rehab center. Um, that says it's there to help them, but ends up really a cover for a multi-billion dollar fraud operation 
that enlists recovering addicts to recruit other addicts for insurance payments. And I am going to flip to, sorry, it takes me a minute. Get back and forth between my screens. Um, I have watched this movie um, multiple times myself, and um, I really do encourage you um, to research it, explore it on your own to truly understand what this is talking about and how these individuals are preying on and taking advantage of people who are reaching out, needing resources, um, and they're being bought and sold for their insurance policies. It's very disturbing. So in kind of following up on that two minute video clip that I showed you as far as the movie trailer goes, there were 16 key points in that two minutes that I'm not sure watching the video trailer once you would have really picked up on, um, but I wanted to point them out because these are how you're going to identify individuals that are coming into your clinics, into your hospitals, into your um, offices that are struggling with substance use disorder, who are actually being victimized or the victim of body brokering, um, patient brokering. So the 16 key points that we saw in that two minute clip is you have an individual, Utah was his name, um, and he actually originated from the Midwest. I believe the movie will tell you he originated in Ohio and he had been using for 10 years. So these are individuals oftentimes who are long time users or in long time addiction. The treatment center that you saw, did you pay attention to that? It's this nice, great, big, beautiful house shown on this cliff, um, overlooking the ocean and located in Malibu. The owner of the facility gathers a crowd to persuade, motivate, and coerce. So he gets up there, he's this motivational presentation speaker, and he's gathering his crowd that are in this treatment facility um, and he's planting the seeds. He's planting seeds right there. The next thing he tells them is we are family. I'm your family. This facility is your family. The people that work here are your family. It, this convinces individuals that their biological family is not healthy. They will tell them, your mom, your dad, your siblings, your friends, um, aunts, uncles, grandparents, they are toxic to you. Um, they need to distance the individual from their biological family and friends. And the treatment center staff becomes their new family, providing for them, having their best interests at heart. You will often hear that counselors, um, recovery coaches, they will refer to these individuals as their children. They will say, I'm your mom, I'm your dad, I'm, you know, think of me as your new grandparent. Um, this is again, planting seed and creating separation and distance. This is how this operation is working. The other thing in the video was they referred to the Affordable Care Act as the gold rush. And they're not far off base from that because of what the Affordable Care Act stated. It was meant for good, um, but unfortunately we have bad players in the marketplace who are preying and utilizing the Affordable Care Act to their advantage. The other thing is they're paid to be in treatment. That individual is paid to be there and it's based off of whatever the payout of their insurance policy will give the treatment is how much that individual who's seeking treatment will actually get paid to be at that facility. You hear this, welcome to the team. It's an indoctrination. Um, it indoctrinates them to a call center and working for the treatment industry 
What happens here is these call centers are oftentimes illegal. They're set up in rented space and um, just about anywhere and um, oftentimes close their businesses and close their doors very quickly. And when or if the law enforcement agencies come in to raid these type of facilities because of illegal practices, the individuals working there, which remember are going to be the individual who's seeking treatment, who is a recovering addict, um, are often the fall guys. They're the ones that are getting in trouble because of the illegal practices. So call center plus capitalism plus the American dream, those were the big words we heard, equals fraud and fall guy. Um, so how this works is the individual actually goes to treatment, the facility will get the kickback and the broker who placed the individual gets a piece of that profit. They entice individuals with money, gifts, houses, cars, drugs, alcohol, um, cigarettes. They are buying, the treatment center is buying their client shoes, clothes, cigarettes, alcohol, um, you name it, sweatshirts, jewelry, um, enticing them to stay there and be a part of this scam and this game. Individuals at rehab are often herded into vans. If you saw that clip of the van, that there were multiple people in that van. Um, and they're often taken to offsite doctors or facilities. This is where you may run across some of these people. If they show up in this van and there's multiple um, and they're coming for, oftentimes we see STI treatment, um, we'll see, um, uh, MAT type treatment, medicated assisted treatment, you know, the buprenorphine, um, or they're there to get implants, um, suboxone or methadone. Um, these facilities don't have on site staff doctors or nurses, these treatment facilities don't. The case manager or the counselor will state when he stated in that clip. Um, that these people, they're going to get high regardless. Unfortunately, what happens is they go through their 30 days. They then are out of inpatient treatment, going to a sober living home. The counselors and their recovery team um, are taking them to their dealer's house to get them their drug of choice, to get them addicted again to take them then to another treatment facility to get the insurance money. This is how this works. Um, so insurance will pay no more than 30 inpatient days for rehab. So their max is 30 days. We will pay 30 days. But it doesn't limit the number of times they will pay that 30 days. And this is that loophole where these brokers figured out, I send somebody to treatment for 30 days, they're inpatient for 30 days, insurance pays for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, I then take them and get them their drug of choice. I relapse them and I take them to another treatment facility to start the 30 day inpatient process over. This is truly how this operation is working. The key hallmark to 12-step processes um, that they briefly referenced in that is that sobriety is a long, slow process. Some are lucky enough to make it, but most aren't. Um, case managers and counselors are using drugs. We saw that in the clip that the case manager and the counselor who got Utah into the treatment was seen um, using drugs in one of those clips and they're often supplying drugs to patients to relapse them. The partners of the treatment facility, so the gentleman who's standing up and doing that motivational speaking is often higher up in the treatment world and the treatment facility, oftentimes they're a partner um, and they're requiring trust 
and requiring secrecy from the individuals who are in rehab. Um, they monitor phone calls. They listen in on phone calls. They monitor any communication going out to family members from these individuals. And I think the really to hit home and the key point that was given in those two minutes is when he said he just made 9,000 in three minutes. Three minutes it took him to make nine, that broker to make $9,000 all day, every day. If you think about how many facilities or treatment centers um, and how many call centers there are that are getting this type of a kickback and getting money from individuals. So trafficking, when we talk about trafficking, there is a difference between trafficking and smuggling. Again, trafficking is just the use of force, coercion, and or fraud to obtain commercial sex acts, labor, or insurance payments. So when we talk about patient brokering and body brokering, it's really that coercion and that fraud that they're utilizing to obtain insurance payments. It is a form of modern day slavery. It is exploitation. And the Merriam-Webster actually defines human trafficking as a noun. Um, so that noun, right? It's an organized criminal activity. It's organized, it's criminal, where human beings are treated as possessions, being controlled and exploited. Smuggling. So smuggling, the term for it, is really that illegal movement of someone across a border or state jurisdiction. So in the case of patient brokering and body brokering, it really fits into two of these categories. It fits into human trafficking and it fits into human smuggling because these individuals are being taken from their home state and transported, whether it's plane, car, bus, um, to another state or another jurisdiction. It's moving humans as part of cargo transport, again, in all different modes of transportation. Smuggling operates, smuggling receives billions of dollars a year um, in these transportation of individuals. Um, and there's really no concern for humanity. That's a, a piece to the smuggling. So, this piece of it, we think about those migrant workers who they put in the back of box trucks and they're transporting them, um, you know, even if it's from one job site to another, um, or they're transporting them from the border to other states or vice versa. Oftentimes the people being smuggled are not viewed as humans, they're not viewed as people they are only viewed as merchandise, as goods. Um, these are those, you know, um, semi drivers and these tractor trailers that are used to transporting goods from one location to another. They're treating people as though they're a good or a commodity or a dispensable item. In smuggling, there's oftentimes not coercion. You won't see that coercion piece. Um, these people who are moving across state lines um, or across jurisdictions um, are willingly going, um, but for the promise of something better often, that's kind of key in, in that as well. And it's a willing facilitation between individuals and smugglers. Um, interestingly enough, oftentimes the smuggled person is often viewed as a criminal. So the person who is being taken advantage of, being treated as a commodity or a good, is often viewed as a criminal. So how do body brokers, patient brokering, human traffickers, how do they really coerce and force individuals? So this is a great wheel. Um, the Polaris Project is also another great resource and another great project that you can um, look up 
that does a lot with human trafficking and um, talks a lot about things that you should look for and things to be aware of. But I like using this power and control rule because you see kind of how it works and how it um, really operates. You have this power and control in this center, right? And so that power and control is for the purposes of this talk, um, the traffickers, the body brokers, um, those individuals who are getting kickbacks at the treatment facilities. And so they're the ones in the center of this wheel with all of the power and control. And how are they taking individuals who are legal adults or sometimes even um, younger adolescents and children and really controlling them? Um, we see that done through intimidation. Uh, you know, that it's harming displays uses of weapon, weapons, sorry about that. And we saw that in that clip is he pulled a gun, right, out of the glove compartment. That's intimidation. Um, lies about police involvement in trafficking situations, harms other people. Um, there's a lot of emotional abuse that occurs in this power and control control wheel. Um, they often will call the individual names. You hear them refer to individuals in treatment, junkies, um, you know, addicts, like you're not worth anything. You're just going to use again, right? You're just going to use again. So I'm going to help you along. Um, and it really begins convincing the victim that the brokers and the treatment centers are the only ones that really care about them. They're the only ones that understand them. They're the only ones that um, can help them. There's isolation. And this piece of it is revolving around getting them away from their family. All human trafficking, that's how it operates, is to isolate. You've got to separate and isolate and get them away from people that they're used to, places that they're used to, how to get around in certain places, what even street names or um, things are like, you know, from one state to another. Um, if you don't know your sense of direction or where you're at, that can be difficult. They will isolate them, they take their phones. There's no way for them to communicate um, and they're relying on this individual who's transporting them. It's denying, blaming, and minimizing. Um, it's exploiting. Then you have the sexual abuse piece of it. Um, you also have a physical abuse piece. It's using privilege, um, gender, age, nationality to suggest that they have superiority. So when you go back to that trailer, movie trailer, in the two minute clip, the um, actor who's portraying the partner who's giving the motivational speaking, Frank Guerrero, um, he's dressed very nice. Everybody else is sitting down and he's standing up and towering over them, um, really giving these subtle hints that he's superior to the individuals in that room. There's economic abuse. Um, these individuals, when they go into treatment centers, and are being um, trafficked for their insurance, have to give up their insurance card, they give up their driver's license, they give up their wallet, they give up their phones. So these treatment facilities have access to social security numbers, insurance, driver's license, super easy for them to steal the identity um, of these individuals and you know go out and get loans or credit cards or apply for um, benefits um, through FSSA or through the federal government, um, Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, unemployment, um, PPPs during COVID. Um, we have a personal story that I'll relate to you in a little bit um, that that exact thing happened. Um, and then there's often coercion and threats that they will harm or they will threaten to harm family members um, they will threaten to harm the victim. 
um, exploit them, expose them, shame them, or oftentimes threaten them that they're going to turn them over to law enforcement um, because they're not clean or they have outstanding warrants. Um, oftentimes law enforcement is used as a big coercion and threat. So who gains from patient brokering? Who gains from it is marketers, individuals who bribe with money or gifts um, and they'll bribe another person to go to a certain treatment facility or sober living home. And a prime example is that they'll receive 500 to thousand dollars for each patient they refer. So this is that person that's on the other end of the phone answering the 1-800 number who said, I just made $9,000 in three minutes. They're the marketer. And oftentimes they receive anywhere from 500 to thousand dollars for each individual that they refer to a treatment center. Treatment center owners are receiving kickbacks for each patient they care for. Doctors receive money from insurance companies for unnecessary treatment or overbill your insurance for labs. Um, prime example of this is a urine drug screen. $10 is the cost of that urine drug screen, but they're charging insurance in excess of $1,000 plus per day per patient or per client that they're drug screening. Again, these are individuals, right, who are in inpatient locked treatment facilities that should not have any access to their drugs of choice or any illicit drugs. Why do they need to have a daily urine drug screen? And why is that being built? Um, gaining profit, oh, 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 I'm so sorry. <laughs> gaining profit through overbilling insurance companies. And I'll kind of show you the trail on how that works. So what are the actual statistics? I gave you all of this information. I know it's a lot to absorb. It's a lot even talking about it. Um, and when I first found out about all of it and began doing my own um, research, I was super overwhelmed for several weeks. Um, but let's talk about statistics real quick. So in 2020, there were 515 cases of human trafficking reported in Indiana. Ranking Indiana the 21st state in the nation as being the 21st highest human trafficking state. Interestingly, there were zero reported cases of patient brokering, body brokering in Indiana. Florida and California are the only states currently with laws on the books to help prevent patient brokering. Indiana currently has no laws on licensing or permits to open a sober living home. What does that mean? Means anybody can open a sober living home or a transitional housing under the preface of um, substance use disorder and have no oversight regulations there's nothing that says you have to have this degree um, in order to open that home. So it's really opened up the door for a lot of illegal activity. Deanna, this is Becky, a quick question. In yeah. the past, Indiana had been ranked closer to 15th, I believe, for uh, human trafficking. And so we've actually dropped some um, do you think that's because, why do you think that is, I guess, is what I want to ask. Are other states just reporting more accurately? Is Indiana really on top of um, uh, making sure that human trafficking doesn't work? Or just, you, you've done a lot of research, so just kind of wondered what your thoughts were on that. So I do think that there's multiple factors that are going into that. Um, I think that other states have gotten better in reporting. Um, first and foremost, 
the other piece to that is these are 2020 statistics. Um, we, and I talk and kind of collaborate with Christina Wicks um, through Indiana Trafficking Victim Assistance Program. Um, and we kind of bounced this back and forth. And she said, you know, I've been looking for 2021 statistics. They're not out. We can't get them. We don't, I don't know what they are. Um, you know, in the midst of this, we had COVID. So a lot of reporting didn't occur because everybody was so focused on COVID that the trafficking, human trafficking wasn't being reported. Um, and it, I do think that there's multiple factors. I think that the reporting wasn't accurate. I don't think that the reporting has been um, as much, especially during COVID. I think other states have gotten better with reporting as well. Um, and there just haven't been enough um, resources or programs like, okay, if I've identified somebody who's being trafficked, but now what? Now what do I do? Um, and so we have all these things, I think, that, that are going into that. Um, I'm just a little hesitant with that statistic only because it's from 2020. Um, and there was a lot of work in 2019, 2020 um, to really focus in on that. And it's since then kind of dropped off. Um, unfortunately, I am afraid that when we see 2021 statistics and even 2022 as we go forward, um, we're going to see an exponential increase in cases. Um, and I have nothing at this particular moment that backs that other than the groups that I'm involved in and the information that I keep up to date with to see that there's a lot more that is being seen. Um, there's actually just recently um, an arrest of about 25 individuals that were involved in a human trafficking ring. Um, in the Johnson County area. Um, so those cases are gonna be reported, um, but that's gonna be 2022. Um, so I, I just am a little hesitant on that statistic. Thank you. Great question though. Um, and then, so who are the victims? Um, and in particular, again, this particular segment is not really focused on the trafficking of children, which is really a completely different subject. Um, we are focusing on the trafficking of adults um, and individuals and trafficking for insurance purposes. And most victims in this group are in the range of 18 to 26 years old with private insurance. We don't really see victims past the age of 26. And the reason being is because once that um, individual has reached the age of 26, they are no longer allowed to be carried on their parents' private insurance. That's why we're not seeing, not that it, it's not happening, but it happens less frequently because this is all about trafficking for insurance. And that's really why we see that max age at 26. Unfortunately, there's more statistics past the age of 26 for individuals who were involved in body brokering or the patient shuffle who had been trafficked. Um, we see a huge spike and increase in overdose death past the age of 26 for individuals who got caught up in the treatment shuffle. Um, and that's for many different reasons. Um, you know, everything from you know, a voluntary as, as voluntarily as an overdose can be to suicide, um, to foul play. Oftentimes it's foul play um, that really just isn't investigated because law enforcement shows up on the scene and they'll look and at the history and they'll say, oh, well, you know, that's just gonna be an overdose. Um, because that individual has a history of substance use disorder, but there's so many stories and families and accounts of where it really truly wasn't an overdose as far as that individual voluntarily injected themselves or 
however they choose to do their drug of choice, whether it's smoking or snorting, um, that there was some kind of force that the individual was held down and injected with a lethal dose of their drug of choice. Um, so these, there's so many things going into play here um, and it gets very convoluted. And so I try to just touch the surface um, because I honestly could probably sit here and talk to you for eight hours on exactly step by step by step um, on how all of this is working. The other victims in this are insurance providers. The insurance companies are being overbilled for unnecessary treatments and labs and things that um, just were not appropriate. And then that cost is passed down to us, passed down to us, the consumer who carries that insurance, who has to pay premiums every single year, who has deductibles and deductibles go up to cover the cost of this overbilling. Um, so our insurance rates are going up each time that the insurance is billed and overbilled. Um, the other victims are individuals who are going into treatment centers. And these treatment centers who are bidding on patient information, um, bidding on private insurance companies to come to their facility. Um, it's kind of sick when you think about it, but it's almost like an auction. Who has this insurance? Who has this insurance? And the treatment centers are, I, I want this insurance or I want this because they know how easy they can overbill. They know how quickly they're gonna get their payments from the insurance company. And they know whether or not that insurance company is gonna give them pushback. So we can't talk about um, this without talking about the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Um, and it is a federal law governed by CMS or the Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services to prevent group health plans and health insurance companies from disallowing coverage of mental health or substance use disorder. So again, this is meant for good. This was great progress and meant for good, but there's a loophole in that and the unsavory players figured it out and they're using this to their advantage. And what that really means is by this act, um, that insurance companies can't deny substance use disorder treatment or mental health treatment, and those are deemed as essential benefits. Great progress in that. We needed that. It's the unsavory characters who figured out the loophole. And it also allowed the parents to keep children on their policies until the last day of the month of their 26th birthday. So when we go back to the statistics and we talk about, you don't really see this past the age of 26, this is why. And it also prohibited declining coverage due to a pre-existing condition or dropping insurance coverage if you were ill or being treated for a disorder or a disease. So it took away that pre-existing pre condition clause. There's actually six classifications of coverage under the Mental Health Parity Addiction Equity Act. And you have inpatient in-network, inpatient out-of-network, outpatient in-network, outpatient out-of-network, emergency care, this is where most of you may fit in, um, and prescription drugs. And so what it also talked about, which this note was important to really focus in on as well, um, that if, if your insurance plan would generally exclude benefits for a particular prescription drug, um, condition or a disorder, um, that under the Mental Health Parity Addiction Equity Act, that that insurance company, if that individual is being treated for substance use disorder or they're being treated for mental health, they cannot um, refuse to cover the prescription drug or, and, and they have to include it on their formulary 
Um, it gets really technical in here, but that's kind of the general overall basis. Um, and they can utilize prescriptions or they can utilize drugs that are not listed as mental health or substance use drugs. So what I mean by that is gabapentin. Gabapentin is a big one that often gets used in substance use disorder um, and often gets used in these addiction treatment centers. Seroquel, your antipsychotics are another big one. Um, oftentimes these individuals are prescribed heavy doses of antipsychotics, they're prescribed gabapentin, they're prescribed, um, you know, clonidine, um, all of these things that they weren't previously on before their substance use disorder, but they go to these treatment facilities or inpatient facilities and are being given kind of this cocktail. Um, and the insurance company can't deny the coverage of that prescription drug. Um, because it's under the Mental Health Parity Addiction Equity Act. Then we have another law that's dealing with human trafficking and patient brokering, um, and this is called the ECRA law. Um, that's the Eliminating Kickback and Recovery Act. It came onto the scene in January around 2020, or I'm sorry, it was Prior to that, um, but the Department of Justice in January 10th of 2020 announced it had its first criminal prosecution under the ECRA law, which was signed into law of 2018. So it gets signed into law in October of 2018. We don't even see a criminal prosecution of this um, until January 10th of 2020. So we're looking at you know two years that before we ever see any movement on this law. Um, and that's pretty standard, especially when we're dealing with all of the pieces of the pie of how this um, organized crime is working. It takes so long um, to get any kind of, you know, prosecution, a case, they're investigating, there's so many pieces to it. Um, and when you're talking about substance use disorder and you're talking about someone in active addiction um, who's in the throes of their active addiction or in the throes of recovery or they're in the way of being trafficked and brokered, we don't have two years to sit and wait for additional you know, law enforcement to kind of come in and do this whole big investigation. That individual needs help and needs help then and they need to get out of that situation. Just paying attention to my time here, Becky. Um, so it's a criminal statute intended to prohibit patient brokering in the context of substance use addiction treatment. It does prohibit knowingly and willfully soliciting, receiving, paying, or offering any re remuneration, including kickback, bribes, rebates, to induce a referral of an individual to or an exchange of an individual for using the services of a recovery home, a clinical treatment facility, or a lab. Um, ECRA also applies to all clinical lab services. Um, keep this in mind because I'm gonna show you a, in a couple of slides, I'm gonna show you something that this will come into play and make sense. Um, but even those don't often relate to substance abuse treatment. Um, So the multi-billion dollar industry, we've talked about what is human trafficking. I showed you how patient brokering and everything works. Um, and we talked about some of the laws and regulations and rules surrounding patient brokering, human trafficking for insurance, um, and really understanding that this is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's a multi-billion dollar organized crime network for-profit treatment centers. Those can often include detoxes, inpatient units, outpatient facilities, sober living homes. There's little or no oversight. Regulating bodies that you could refer back to on this would be the Joint Commission, which is not a required governing body. It is an exclusive club slash service paid into by a facility to prepare them 
or their organization just for a state inspection, or you have CAR um, Commission on Accreditation of Rehab Facilities. This talks about the golden ticket, the Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield is the golden ticket in insurance policies that these treatment centers are looking for. They pay the most, they have very little pushback, um, and oftentimes even if you're reporting healthcare fraud to them, you're told, yes, we're aware, what do you want us to do? The ACA says that we cannot deny coverage. Um, the second big company that these treatment centers are looking for is Cincinnati, um, United Healthcare, Humana, and then it would be your private small insurance company. So these are the big hitters in insurance that the brokers are looking for. Do they have Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield? Um, and the rest of these. Um, oftentimes the very first thing that the call centers and the brokers will talk to the individual about is yes, I can get you in a treatment facility, what's your insurance? And they want that insurance name and they want that insurance policy, should be a red flag. This talks about liquid gold. Um, sorry, the, it looks like the, the picture kind of covered that up. Um, talks about urine as being the liquid gold. Um, there is a YouTube video, I think in the interest of time, um, I will just leave that link in this handout. You can go back and watch it because it's kind of, I think it's like a five minute video, um, but for the interest of time, we won't show that video today. Um, but just understanding, this is again, part of that kickback. How does liquid gold or urine work? It's overbilling for urine drug screens. The urine is considered the liquid gold. Um, it's big, big business. Um, and we're all paying for it because Medicare is paying for it. Um, in fact, the program is writing multi-million dollar checks to the companies that perform the lab tests. Um, there are virtually no national standards regarding who gets tested for which drugs and how often. Again, think about it. Patient, person's in an inpatient treatment center, it's locked. They can't leave, nobody can come in, and every single day they're testing that urine for drugs and billing insurance for this. Um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because they should not have access to drugs if they're in a locked inpatient treatment facility. So this slide really just talks about 1-800-HELP-ME-SCAM-THE-SYSTEM. Um, How does this start? Where does it start? It starts with the 1-800-877-866 numbers that individuals call to get into treatment. They're aggregate call centers. They're out of state. They have out of state numbers. They will immediately ask the individual who um, is seeking treatment what is their insurance policy name? What, is, what are their numbers? And they've already ran it in the background um, and are looking to place which facility will give them the most kickback for that. The first connection is with a broker when they get, um, they call the 800 number. Um, that broker befriends them, tells them, hey, they're gonna be your new BFF. They're gonna get you to a place. You're gonna keep in contact with them and they gain this individual's trust. They also attempt to connect you with treatment centers that are out of state. That's a big red flag as well. Warning signs of patient brokering. If they state that the treatment is free or you're told that the treatment center will pay your insurance deductible for you to go there. They offer free airfare to get to their facility. They offer perks. They offer gifts. I live in Indiana, and especially in the winter, if I've got a facility telling me to come to Florida or California where it's 70 degrees and sunny, and it's on the beach and the ocean, and you've got room and board, and we're going to give you food, and we're going to do all of these things, I say sign me up too. Um, who doesn't want that? They're using locations as um, part of this. 
The professionals affiliated with the treatment centers um, typically are only available, and that's professionals, when I mean medical professionals, um, you know, counselors, licensed social workers, um, nurse practitioners, whoever that may be, um, typically are only available once, a, once or twice a month. It will take weeks for an individual to schedule an appointment inside a facility um, with one of these individuals. And they often don't see the same professional um, more than once for the same issues. Family participation is often not allowed or permitted and is limited to only a few hours. Um, all phone calls, are, phone calls are being monitored, recorded. Um, it's being done on counselors' personal cell phones. It's not even coming from your loved one's cell phone. So how do you spot a victim? You spot a victim, um, any individual who's receiving money and or gifts to go to perform a certain act or go to a certain treatment facility. Um, so those would be questions you would maybe start asking some of these individuals that you saw, you know, how are you getting cigarettes? How are you getting um, your clothing? How is your food being provided for? How are you going um, and doing activities? Um, most cases you see will come out of sober living houses or treatment centers. Most of the patient brokering crime is committed online or through call centers. Again, if this individual was taken to a treatment center outside of their home state and tells you that they had contacted a 1-800 number um, and were flown to a different state, they are being trafficked. So those are just questions that you can ask if they show up at your clinic, they show up in your ER, or they show up in your office. Um, and again, remembering Florida and California right now are the only two states in the U.S. Um, with Patient Brokering Act Sober Homes Task Force to help prevent patient brokering because most of the individuals were being um, trafficked down to Florida and California. Now that Florida and California have these laws and these acts on the book and they have sober home task force. Um, we're seeing some of these shady players or these shady treatment centers really um, coming under the crossfires of the sober home, sober homes task force. And they're starting to um, receive law enforcement involvement in these illegal practices. This sign, and I'm not going to read all of it. I know it's a little um, small to see. Um, there's actually two signs, but you do have the handout. I would encourage you to go through this and look through these for yourselves. But these are 23 signs of exploitation, specifically revolving around addiction treatment centers, patient brokering, and human trafficking, um, and body brokering. Great information on these 23 steps. It'll really tell you how to spot it, how to, what to look for, and even kind of um, jumpstart your brain with some questions to maybe like implement in um, your facility and in your practice to try to identify these. This is a follow-up to that. Um, this slide is really talking about who is the devil in disguise. We've talked all about body brokering, patient brokering, and human trafficking, and insurance. Um, and the, really, the devils in disguise here are the brokers and the call center operators who are on the other end. It's the um, you know individuals who operate these treatment facilities that are overbilling insurance and have illegal practices, um, utilizing a cult mentality. Um, in order to coerce their patients and their clients. Um, they do a lot of the devil in disguise themselves or the broker um, or the trafficker. Um, there's a lot of profiling for their victims. What I mean by that is they oftentimes are looking for individuals who have been longtime users, maybe in legal trouble, they may be on probation, um, and they know that if they get them from their home state where they're on probation to another state, that they'll use that as part of a coercion or a threat, that if you don't follow and do what I say, we're going to call your probation officer and turn you in and you're going to go back to jail. This is the situation that happened in um, my scenario with my son. Um, 
They're also looking for people who um, they want to separate them from their family, their support systems, and their surroundings. That's why they move them to a different state. Um, we can see um, some of these practices in elite or in inpatient centers, a lot of sober living homes and transitional housing units. Again, there's no laws, there's no regulations, nothing around these um, places. Dealers um, are standing outside on the other side of the inpatient treatment facility, um, waiting for people to be discharged so that they can offer them, them their drug of choice. These dealers know where to pick up their clientele at. And it's a relapse, repeat, and rent cycle. So just briefly, a little bit here, um, I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about craft and enough time for any questions. I won't go as detailed into my personal story. Um, why do I do what I do? Why do I talk about this? And why do I try to educate? And why do I try to find platforms um, to get our story out there? First and foremost, it's personal. Um, this is my son, and this is in January of 2020, right as he's going to the airport and being flown back down to Florida from Indiana um, for the second time. He had been trafficked down to Florida once and came back. I was able to encourage him to come back. And this is the second time that he's being trafficked from Indiana to Florida. He has um, been in active addiction for well over 15 years. And he is in active addiction in this picture. Um, this is what he looked like, maybe 90 pounds. Um, can't really tell with the sweatshirt on. As the treatment center bought him a plane ticket, and paid for his flight from Indiana to Florida to get him in a treatment facility again. Um, this would be his approximate eighth treatment center in Florida. Um, and he had kind of been shuffled and moved all around in Florida. Um, some of these are his words. I um, was hoping a little bit that um, he would feel comfortable enough to maybe speak to you today and give a personal account. He just didn't feel um, up to it quite yet. Um, I, at this point, am a success story um, in getting my son out of the patient shuffle, getting my son out of being brokered from treatment facility to treatment facility. Um, it was a lot of hard work. I was involved with a lot of different law enforcement agencies at the federal level, um, from the Department of Justice to the Office of Attorney General, um, to the FBI, to the Department of Homeland Security. Um, there has not been any movement to date as far as I have been told or am aware of prosecuting the brokers and the treatment facilities. Um, they have evidence and information, um, and again, I'm stuck in this year and a half, almost two year battle of patient brokering and body brokering. Um, he was sent to numerous different treatment facilities. They were all free and paid for by insurance, or oftentimes you'll hear them refer to, I'm on scholarship. There's no scholarship. That's just a fancy term of saying we're overbilling your insurance or we're going to illegally utilize somebody else's insurance. Um, my son was offered drugs and money to relapse, um, to go to another facility, to go back to a detox center so that the insurance company could be billed again. My insurance company was very well, well aware of what was occurring. Um, but again, kept referring back to the Affordable Care Act, Mental Health Parity um, Addiction Equity Act that they couldn't deny the claims. In total, I can tell you 
that my insurance company in the span of a year and a half to two years um, was billed well over. Uh, I think the total sum ended up being $285,000 just for my son. And that was literally one and a half to two years max um, is what they ended up being ultimately billed. Um, is it in Indiana? Yes, it is. It's happening. My son was brokered from a treatment center in Indiana to Florida. He was brokered from Indiana to Florida. He was trafficked across state lines, across state jurisdiction to another state. It is personal for me. It is always going to be personal. There's so much more to the story that I could go into um, to really just tell you about the horrors and the nightmares that ensued and things that happened. Um, but this is my reason that I am on this platform and I talk and I try to educate. This is a picture right before my son um, getting ready to get on that airplane. On the left-hand side is his grandma. Um, I keep your terror and the worry and um, the love that my mother has for my son as a grandmother. Um, and not knowing if this was the last time we were actually going to physically hold him and see him. Again, I am one of the rare success stories. Um, most parents and grandparents aren't as successful, aren't able to get their individual out of um, body brokering or human trafficking and will often lose their loved one, um, again, to suicide, overdose, or foul play. And I wanted to touch on these photos. So this is what I really wanna hit home with you. When you are taking care of an individual and you see them in the emergency department or you see them in their clinic, um, and you're seeing that individual who's in active addiction or who is in substance use disorder. This is what you see. This is what you're used to seeing. You see the person who's using, you see the addict, and there's so many names and so much language, um, but they're not seen as someone's son and someone's grandson who is grieving in the background for them. They're not seen as this person. They're not seen as the child they once were. They were not always an addict. They were not always doing illegal things. And they don't want to be an addict and they don't want to do illegal things. They were a child once with the goofy grin and cute little blonde hair and big brown eyes. That's my son. That's who I see every single day when I look at him. That's who I see. That's who I want you to see too. See past the addiction. See past their current situation. These are brief slides again, like I wanted to just bring up um, when we talked about the ECRA law um, and the Department of Justice. So two individuals, and this is from June 27th of 2022. Um, the Department of Justice um, basically states, puts out a press release, two individuals are convicted in $1.4 billion healthcare fraud scheme involving rural hospitals. This is you guys. $1.4 billion healthcare fraud scheme scheme involving rural hospitals in Florida, Georgia, and Missouri. It's happening in your small area too. Then we have June 29th of 2022, um, DOJ puts out another press release. Sober homeowner was sentenced to 30 months in prison for a $4.5 million kickback scheme. $4.5 million in kickback that that sober home owner um, received. 
And the links to where to find the full press releases are at the bottom of this slide. This is a link, or this is information office by the attorney and Office of Attorney General um, in Massachusetts. What I want you to pay attention to in this slide, three clinical laboratories. Remember, we're going back to that ECRA law. We're going back to that kickback law. We're going back to the Mental Health Parity Addiction Equity Act. Three laboratory owners were charged with defrauding Massachusetts Health, money laundering, and illegal kickback. The defendants were indicted by a statewide grand jury on the following charges. Guys, what does it mean for Indiana? Right here. You have Westfield, Indiana, Medicaid false claims, three counts, larceny, false pretenses, kickbacks, bribery, conspiracy, money laundering. Westfield, Indiana. Then you have Soros Clinical Solutions of Indianapolis, Indiana. Medicaid, false claims, larceny, kickbacks, bribery, rebates, conspiracy. ARIA Diagnostics of Indianapolis, Indiana. Medicaid, false claims, larceny, kickbacks, bribery, rebates, conspiracy. Indiana has a problem. It is here. This is why this matters. So I'll kind of briefly stop there for a moment and talking about human trafficking and patient brokering. Um, see if there's just any brief questions right now before I give you some tools to put on your tool belt. Actually, Deanna, we have about five minutes left. So I don't know that we have time really to go into the craft bottle, but really appreciate you covering everything. Definitely lots of good treatment centers out there. Important to really have good relationships um, as you refer patients uh, to those treatment centers. Um, but um, I think what we'll do is we'll schedule another time to go over craft because it's an important tool and I want to make sure that we give it the time that it deserves to be able to be shared. So I want to open it up, though, to see what questions are out there or any comments. I don't have a question, but I just want to get your contact information if possible. Or Beck, if you can send it to me. Um, Michelle, that way I can. Sure. Oh, perfect. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. I'll put it on the screen for you. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to have you speak with our Valley Addiction Program or even just um, maybe the providers because we have providers all over several different sites. And sometimes the providers are referring like medical, but a lot of times it's our Valley Addiction Program. But with there is sober living, new ones popping up all over the all over the place, especially in Terre Haute. So we just had that. So thank you very much. Yes, it's a new topic. Um, you know, we hear about human trafficking and I think people really just are thinking it's a child or it's an adult and not really understanding that this piece of it is really not being discussed. Mm -hmm. People aren't paying attention to this piece of it. Um, and so just bringing awareness to that in general, that this truly is happening. I think it helps a lot with stigma reduction too, because I feel like a lot of times people that struggle with addiction don't get heard the same. And I'm actually doing a stigma reduction uh, panel tonight in Vermilion County. So I'm hoping it's well attended, but you know, oftentimes it used to make us the ER or the doctor and they're like, this is happening or that's happening. And they're not listened to the same. And you know, so we're living, it's, they're ran strict sometimes, but sometimes there's rules and regulations, but sometimes there's stuff that you're just kind of like questioning. So, um, and I wonder, I know when there's recovery works and, um, or if Medicaid helps pay for anything, if there's no laws, I don't know what that looks like, but I know there'd be like audits, but that's still a whole different, I think something to look at. It's very convoluted. <laughs> it takes a very long time to really pull out all of the pieces of it. Um, and one of my favorite sayings, or one thing I really like in speaking about stigma, is change the language and you change the leverage. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so hopefully you can join again when we can talk about craft because that's a big basis of craft and why I say it's useful in um, you know, emergency departments, clinics, and for our providers that we have to teach, um, you have to change the language to change the leverage. Um, I even had to learn that myself with my own son. Sure, I think is that craft is that the family based group. So we yeah. have um, we have a craft group in Crawfordsville, and then we have staff trained. I think in our Cayuga office, and I know Clinton, and we're working on Terre Haute. So it's just getting people to attend. Um, it's tough sometimes, um, especially because it's like one more thing. Sometimes it feels like form. So we're trying to find a way to reach people that need it and make it work for them. And they're free, they're free, so that's nice. Wonderful. Well, if you have questions or you have concerns or something pops up later, let um, me know or let Elizabeth Burroughs know or Jessica Thomas, and we're glad to connect you with the people that maybe can get answers to questions for you. And thank you so much, Deanna, for sharing today uh, good information. Uh, a little bit of a repeat for a few people that have been with us since the very beginning, but I also think this is one of the things through COVID that kind of kind of got put on a back shelf and so we needed to bring it back to the forefront. Um, always, um, always appreciate everything you share. So thank you all so much. Stay safe and um, stay well. And we will be in touch and let you know when we'll be sharing the craft information. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.